Welcome to Kings River Life's Mystery Rats Maze podcast, where we share with you mystery short stories and first chapters of mystery novels read by local actors. This episode features the first chapter of Ruined Stones, written by Mary Reed and Eric Mayer as Eric Reed, read by Fresno actor Patty Myers. Patty's also a member of the Fresno Irish band Celtic Alchemy, which can be found on Facebook. Ruined Stones was published in July of 2017 by Poisoned Pen Press. Set during World War II, Ruined Stones, written by Mary Reed and Eric Mayer as Eric Reed, takes place in the British industrial city of Newcastle on Tyne, where the remains of the Roman temple that plays a major part in the plot still exist. The city is depicted as it was in late 1941, except that the two streets of terraced houses where much of the action unfolds are fictional. Chapter 1 The young woman waited beside the ruins in the December night. While she waited, she smoked. To someone watching from a short distance, she would have been a barely perceptible thickening in the unbroken darkness of the blackout. Anyone in the street, and there were a few about at this late hour, would have seen nothing more than the red blinking demon eye at the end of her cigarette. During the day, Benwell's Roman temple was not impressive. The remains of the walls were less than knee high. Two carved altars sat at one end, that was all. Tonight, though, she couldn't see the ruins. The idea she was standing where the ancients had worshipped strange gods chilled the woman more than the biting wind off the river Tyne. Why this should be, she, she couldn't say. <laughs> it wasn't as if she hadn't waited here before. The place was a customary place of business for professional women. Located in a green space between houses, offered privacy. Everyone knew where it was, and a copper couldn't very well move you along for loitering if you're only admiring a local landmark, which, truth to tell, suited both working girls and whoever worked coppers. Where was he? She checked her watch. The dial glimmered ghost-like in the smothering darkness. It would be Christmas before long. Her mam had always taken her to church on Christmas Eve. What would she say if she saw her daughter now, waiting at a pagan temple for... But she couldn't know, because her daughter had left home long before and never returned. Maybe next Christmas, if things worked out, maybe she'd be able to return as a respectable woman, as her mam would put it. She could almost smell the turkey, taste the mince pies, see the Christmas pudding... She wouldn't even resist eating Brussels sprouts, not that there'd be little of the traditional if rations were still in effect. Could you even find Christmas crackers these days? When pulled, they were always startled by the bangs, <laughs> even though they knew what was coming. Her dad had always balked at putting on the paper hat from his cracker. Finally, he agreed and pulled it down to his ear, looking silly, all for the amusement of the kids as they realized when they were older. When she left, she hadn't guessed she'd ever miss such common things. She'd been wrong, at least when Christmas brought back memories. A footstep crunched on frozen grass behind her. Chapter Two Welcome to Newcastle, Miss Baxter. Sergeant Joe Bain sounded less than enthusiastic. Come to bring the woman's touch to the station, have you? It was not the sort of city police station Grace had expected. During peacetime, it had been a corner shop, some distance along Carter Street from the Masonette where she was lodging. The sergeant's office had been the shopkeeper's kitchen. She hoped her duties did not involve the kettle on the cooker behind the table the sergeant was using for a desk. Baines must have noticed her looking around. We're still in a bit of a shambles, he explained. The authorities thought it safe to move the station further from the river, and so here we are. He removed his spectacles, rubbed his reddened eyes, and then his wide forehead. He was prematurely balding. There was a doughy look to his features. Grace was used to men with weathered faces. She was dark-haired and dark-eyed, with a broad face, the face of a countrywoman. She still had the rosy complexion of youth. <laughs> a 
Got a bit of a headache, Baines continued. And uh, speaking of headaches, I want to make it plain right away. I do not believe women should be involved in police work. It's nothing personal, you understand? But I, I was told... Never mind what you were told. For a start, you're not strong enough to deal with violent drunks. As we would say in Glasgow, come chucking out time and fights with broken bottles break out in the gutter, and that's the women. Grace bit her tongue. Not strong enough. She'd grown up assisting in cleaning out barns and baling hay. However, Baines continued, if we must work with women, and it would appear that we must, I will admit that they can deal with certain situations better than men. Apart from filing and answering the phone, your official duties will also involve assisting refugees, keeping an eye on young girls and kids likely to get into trouble, moving nymphs of the pavement along, and settling domestic disputes. You'll be on the day shift, though with the manpower shortages our schedules are usually erratic. Any questions? Uh, none, sir. She had plenty of questions, but was afraid of losing her temper at the answers that she might get. Good. I hope you're up to learning on the job. We can't spare men for training. You have to get to know the locals. So today I'm sending you out to take statements about an incident last night. Women like to gossip and are more likely to talk to another woman. Constable Wallace will give you a tour of the neighborhood, show you where it took place, and leave you to it. He got up, revealing himself to be shorter than Grace, who thought she could certainly handle him if he were an unruly drunk. Which <laughs> was not what she should be thinking about her commanding officer at their first meeting. Baines poked his head around the kitchen door. Wallace, a minute if you would. The white-haired officer who entered the kitchen looked well past retirement age. Wallace, show me spacks to the file on that dead woman, will you? And get me a headache powder. Grace followed the older man back into the former shop. The shells held a wireless. Stack of forms, steel helmets, and gas masks, rather than tin food and jars of sweets. The young constable at the desk, once the shop counter, looked at Grace as if he'd never seen a woman in a police uniform before. <laughs> Perhaps he hadn't. Constable Wallace, let me introduce myself properly. I'm Grace Baxter. Well, I'm Martha Wallace. Do you mind if I call you Grace? We're an informal lot here. Already annoyed by Bain's attitude, Grace looked at the uh, man in bemusement. Didn't he take her seriously either? He went on, apparently oblivious to her discomfiture. I don't belong here any more than you do. There I was, good and retired from police work, and then the war broke out. All the young officers were being called up, so here I am again, doing my bit. Oh, my father was the village constable before he joined up. Oh, that's how I got involved in police work. Where are you from? Nodweir. Nodweir? Can't say the name's familiar. Why, well, I'm not surprised. It's a tiny place in Shropshire, uh, near the Welsh border. Is that so? We have a different class of crime here in the city. No stolen cows. This is a working class area. A lot of the residents are employed at the Vickers factory along Scotswood Road. They work hard and drink hard. Unfortunately, the blackouts made Newcastle a playground for criminals. Now some have guns. Before the war, it was knives, broken bottles, and lead pipes. And we were relying on inexperienced officers and old-timers like myself. The war has also given us a black market to deal with. Well, I'm here to help, if I'm allowed to. Ah, uh, don't worry, you will. We need all the help we can get. Don't let Sergeant Baines bother you. He's been distracted, going through a, through a bad time. He's a good sort, normally. But these headaches of his... He rummaged in a drawer under the counter. Where the hell are those powders? Uh, look on the shelf behind you, Grace suggested. What? Oh. Oh, yes. I, I see them. He straightened up with a grunt. Bloody arthritis. He found a folder on a shelf and handed it to her. Glance over it while I have a couple of words with the sergeant. A woman was found dead earlier this morning in the ruins of the local Roman temple. 
an accident, apparently. Scanty details at present, of course. So we haven't yet reached the point where we can claim, as Baines would uh, no doubt say in his quaint Scottish way, many a mickle has made a muckle. Which, translated, means there are very few facts to be gathered together in a lump representing a definite solution. A Roman temple here. That struck Grace as strange. She drew a stool up to the counter. The young officer manning it kept glancing at her from the corner of his eye. She turned slightly to show him her woman's auxiliary police corps badge and opened the folder. The first item she saw was a rough sketch of a rectangular foundation. A pair of small squares labeled as altars stood inside the structure in front of a semicircular wall at one end. The woman's body was roughly sketched, arms and legs awkwardly positioned. Grace read on. The cause of death appeared to be a severe injury caused by the woman falling and striking her head on the nearest altar. She carried no identity card or handbag and was described as dark-haired, slight of build, about five foot four, with an estimate age in the mid-twenties. She wore a green skirt and overcoat, white blouse, low-heeled shoes, and what was described as the usual undergarments. I'll bet you don't find dead bodies beside ancient Roman temples in that little country village of yours, the returning Wallace remarked. She remembered the deaths associated with another ancient religious site the stone circle on Guardian's Hill overlooking Nodweir. She kept the thought to herself. The dead woman is unidentified? Aye, a mystery woman. Stu McPherson notified us. Lives in this street. He was on the way to school when he found her. She was probably a tart. That grassy bit where the ruins sit is well known as a perfect place for such ladies to meet clients at night. I wouldn't expect to find a, a, a Roman temple sitting in the middle of houses on a city street. Ah, uh, there's not much left of it, man. Not surprising, seeing how it was built almost 2,000 years ago. Or so they told us at school. The altar she hit her head on isn't the original, though. Apparently it was a cast. Not that it mattered to the poor woman's skull. She wasn't a tart. Maybe she was drunk, wandering around in the blackout, tripped and hit her head. That might have been a robbery, and the assailant knocked her down. That's possible, Wallace shrugged. All sorts of things could have happened, but until I have reason to believe otherwise, my opinion is that it was an accident. It says here that judging from the body's condition, she died in the evening. That means she would have been lying there all night. It's dark as the pit there with the blackout. Anyone crossing that open area would have had to trip over the body to notice it. Grace ran her gaze down the typed report. What do you make of the comment of the boy who found her about the way the woman was posed? You mean like a swastika? Rubbish. She accidentally wound up sprawled that way when she fell. Kids that age have a good imagination. Grace examined the artist's sketch again. Was the body really lying there like this? Oh, I didn't notice anything so exaggerated. Artistic license. He stood up. Now, I'm supposed to show you around the neighborhood before you start with your interviews. He held the door open for her. And Miss Baxter, here in Newcastle, we aren't a superstitious lot. Don't get carried away with any swastika nonsense. She said nothing. But as they left the station, she thought it wasn't simply that the sketch showed the woman's limbs laid out in the shape of a swastika, uh, being a countrywoman, one filled by her grandmother with folk wisdom, she recognized the arrangement of the victim's bent arms and legs presented the appearance of an ancient symbol of good fortune, and incidentally, one that was the reverse of the Nazi swastika. This reading of Ruined Stones was produced by Kings River Life and directed by Lori Lewis Hamm. Ruined Stones is available for purchase. You can learn more about this book and others in the series on the author's website, home.earthlink.net slash tilde maywright. 
Check out Kings River Life Magazine's websites for more mystery, local theater, animal rescue, and so much more. KingsRiverLife.com and KRLNews.com. We'll be back next time with another mystery short story or mystery first chapter. Subscribe to our podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode. And follow us on Twitter to keep up with everything KRL at Kings River Life. Until next time, this is your announcer, Jim Tuck, wishing you a life full of mystery.